Hi everyone, Dr. Samantha Cotrera here for the Imagining a New We video blog, a video series designed to help history teachers and other history educators teach history in ways that are more meaningful, transformative, and inclusive for their students. I've been doing these Mondays are meaningful videos um, all through the fall semester and leading up to the end of the fall semester. What I thought I would do is pull out theoretical works and reflection questions directly from my new book, Transforming the Canadian History Classroom, Imagining a New We. The idea isn't to quote myself necessarily, but to be able to bring out theories that I quote in each chapter. So this is the second week. So this would be chapter two in order for you to think about the kind of things that I've been thinking about maybe in broader ways than um, you have had space to or um, interest in or even just like the invitation to before. I mean, maybe you have all those things and you haven't cared, but I'm going to make you care. <laughs> I mean, I'm not, but uh, I would like you to care, I guess. Um, this week, I want to focus on chapter two, which is kind of a short chapter that talks about the like landscape of current um, Canadian identity formation and Canadian history curriculum. Um, you know, in writing this book, well, I originally did my research in 2011, and then um, I started drafting the book in 2015, 16, and then obviously it's completed in 2020. And so much has changed in the landscape of Canadian identity. I mean, so much has changed in just this summer <laughs> in terms of Canadian identity. And I argue in this chapter that we're often we're often this weird balancing act between conservative commemoration, um, liberal, inclusive, multicultural celebration, and a post slash neo colonial reconciliation. So, what does reconciliation kind of look like in this world? And if you don't know what I mean by post slash neo colonial, um, there is a body of theory that came from literary theory called post colonial theory that was really about the types of stories that were created by um, people in countries that had been uh, colonized. So um, countries in Africa, for example, after colonization, what was the type of literature that was being created? Now, the problem with the post and post-colonial is that it assumes that colonialism is over. And of course it isn't. So in Canada, like we still, we, we are, we're still under the British crown. We still have the Indian Act. Are we after colonialism? No, we're not. Um, are we in colonialism? Yes. What does this look like? Well, it looks different than it did 200 years ago, right? It looks different than it did 100 years ago. The theory of post-colonialism allows us just to kind of see and hear the nuances of colonial structures in like the late 20th, 21st century. But I say post slash neo-colonialism because neo is like new. So we're kind of facing new types of colonial powers and pressures. Um, I put those words, this, this got very complicated. <laughs> I put those words in parentheses because if you want to understand it as post-colonial, you can. If you just want to understand it as colonial, you can. If you want to understand it as neo-colonial, you can. But to understand the various kind of theoretical ways we come to thinking through and being in colonialism. So what I was saying is that we in Canada are often between these three competing um, competing elements, conservative commemoration, multicultural celebration, and um, post slash neo-colonial reconciliation. What does that mean? It changes all the time. Um, and so it was hard to like write the book by being like, this is what it is at this moment. Um, and so the first half of that chapter, it would be really great if you wanted to reflect on how you understand your own self between those three different kind of ways of colonizing Canadian identity. But the second half of the chapter talks about current trends in Canadian history curriculum. Um, we have 13 different um, curriculum, history curriculum across the country, according to each province and territory. And of course, the curriculum isn't what is taught in the classroom. And because we can have different different curriculum, they can all be different. But what I found in doing a brief survey is that there's a lot of similarities. 
So often history is under the umbrella of social studies. Um, often history curriculum is, is really closely linked with critical thinking and citizenship education. Um, and also that curriculum across the country really follows a skill-based model for understanding history. Um, many provinces use the historical thinking benchmarks. In fact, any um, province that has uh, revised their curriculum after 2011, I believe, specifically referenced Peter Satius's work um, and the benchmarks of historical thinking. So while there could be a lot of different ways, 13 different ways we can approach the past, um, there are a lot of similarities across the provinces. Now, you might be my, familiar with my work criticizing historical thinking. I've mentioned it a few times in the videos. It hasn't been a huge emphasis of things that I have talked about, although feel free to comment below if you are interested in me doing a whole video on my critiques of historical thinking. Um, but one of the things I want to bring up for this video is a quote by veteran educator Bob Davis. He was an Ontario educator. I believe he passed away a couple years ago. And he was criticizing um, attempts to bring in a more skills-based approach to history education like 30 years ago. Because while historical thinking might seem like this new and shiny thing, um, historian, educational historian Ken Osborne found that this idea of focusing on skills in history education comes back at least once a generation. So the quote that I'm going to bring in from Bob, Bob Davis is from the last wave, but I found it really salient when I read his work, what um, whatever happened to high school history. I feel like I'm getting the title wrong, but due to the magic of the editing, it's right here. <laughs> um, I found so much salience in this work that he wrote 25 years ago because I found uh, an alignment of critique of historical thinking. And what he says is, to find your place in the universe is profoundly different than having a bundle of techniques in your pocket. And what I take from this quote is that, and I'm going to draw on my own critiques of historical thinking here, is that when we focus on skills, when we focus on method, when we focus on techniques, just like Bob Davis said, a bundle of techniques in your pocket, we don't necessarily have the space or the room to talk about self, person, emotion, uh, and as Bob Davis said, understanding your place in the universe. So in my teacher's book club guide that is now available online, uh, one of the uh, reflection prompts that I have for chapter two is, are you familiar with critiques of historical thinking? And do you feel like it allows for space for students to understand their place in the universe, connect with affect, that means emotion, connect with their own family histories in a way that, that bring people together rather than just understand them through a bundle of techniques in your pocket. Are you familiar with these critiques? Um, if so, what do you think about them? If reading the book was the first time you've encountered them, what do you think about these ideas? Um, how have you seen them play out in the classroom? And um, what are the ways that you may have allowed for things like emotion and um, exploration of like difficulties in history outside the historical thinking concepts or did you find them useful tools to understand yourself within them now the research that I did was before historical thinking became a key element of the history curriculum in Ontario because my research um, was with teachers in Ontario so while I do have critiques of historical thinking that's not what the book is about um, everyone like I said so many provinces use the historical thinking concepts to, um, to to write their curriculum I know teachers have found them very useful not all teachers but a lot of teachers have found them useful I'm not interested in throwing out the baby with the bathwater. I'm interested in presenting new ways of thinking about history to just like identify that the historical thinking is not quite as objective as I think it's often presented to be. But again, that's not the focus of the book. The focus of the book is actually on students, on teachers, and the ways that we can create more space for exploration in the classroom. Um, so if you like love historical thinking, you'll, you can still love the book. Um, in fact, 
I hope you do love the book. Next week, I'm going to talk about chapter three, which is about students. It's one of my favorite chapters because I use the voices of students to really identify what they want in their history education. So I hope you watch next week's Mondays, our meaningful video, and I hope you have a great week.